Thanks for tuning in. As you file into the room here at Georgia Tech, we're going to start momentarily. And if you're watching remotely, we will also start in just a bit. Thanks for tuning in.
Okay. All right. All right. Great crowd. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We got more energy. We got Shane Kimbrough here. All right. Well, welcome to the folks that are here in, in the audience. It is a packed house. Uh, one thing to know about Shane, you're going to hear so many amazing things. I'll give you uh, a brief background, but he actually is a cool guy, right? <laughs> and that is not in the bio. Um, so for those that don't know me, I'm Raheem Bia. I'm the Dean of Engineering. So if you're in the College of Engineering, I have a little something to do with, uh, with your program. Nice to meet you all. Uh, in addition to having folks here in front of us uh, in, in 3D, which I'm so excited about, we also are live streaming this event. And we have lots of, or several K through 12 schools that are, that are right here in Atlanta. So Centennial Academy, which is right across the street from campus, is here. Hello, Centennial. Shout out to Centennial. Uh, Drew Charter School in East Atlanta, they're also watching. Um, a couple of schools that are watching from Southwest Atlanta, which is where I reside, Tuskegee Airmen Global Academy, who we have a really nice partnership, Aerospace does. And they're celebrating their College and Career Motivation Week. And Ms. Ross's sixth grade class at the H.J. Russell West End Academy is also watching. We're joined by students at the Hollis Innovation Academy in Vine City. And also, I know some students from Woodward Academy um, in College Park, they've jumped in. So it's lots of amazing students, some college students, and also elementary school students that are, that are here, graduate students and undergraduates. All right. In just a few moments, we're going to hear from today's special guest, astronaut Shane Kimbrough. He's going to give a presentation about his career and three missions to space. After that, he'll be joined by Naya Butler-Craig, one of our fantastic PhD students in aerospace. And she's going to moderate the Q&A session. And I know you all have a lot of really tough questions, so make sure you have them queued up. I'm giving you an opportunity to think about it now. And she's going to take questions from the room as well as virtually. Naya is a PhD student here, as I mentioned, and she's also a NASA Space Technology Graduate Research Fellow and a NASA Pathways Intern in the Science and Space Technology Systems Branch at the Glenn Research Center. So basically, she's just awesome, right? I'll just sum it up with that. Her long-term goal is to be an astronaut, right? And so I look forward to you coming back, speaking at one of these events. I'll be watching it in person or streaming, but I will, I will check it out. I know you're going to do it. Uh, the goal is to set to, to walk on the moon and then eventually to Mars. Wow, that's a that's a long trip. I, it's I don't like my commute back to my house, which is like 30 minutes. Thank you, Naya, for hosting today's event. So let's talk about Shane. It's not every day you get to hear from an astronaut, let alone one that spent more than half of 2021 away from Earth. After growing up here in Atlanta and going to tech sporting events, Shane Kimbrough graduated from high school at. Lovett School, and then attended West Point, and then came to Georgia Tech and got a graduate degree. Uh, his undergraduate degree is in aerospace engineering, surprise, uh, and he has a master's from the H. Milton School of Industrial and Systems Engineering. Shane was selected to be an astronaut in 2004. His first mission was in 2008 when he flew on the Space Shuttle Endeavor along with two other tech grads, Eric Bowe and one of our own faculty members, Sandy Magnus who was just elected into the National Academy of Engineering, which is pretty doggone awesome. <laughs> Shane returned to space in 2016, lifting off from Kazakhstan and docking with the International Space Station, where he lived for six months and served as commander. In addition to performing science experiments and three spacewalks, he also flew a flag. This is the most important part of the mission. He flew a flag from the rambling wreck, right? That was it. There we go. That deserves applause. Then last April, Shane became the fourth person in history to travel on three different spacecrafts, this time launching from Cape Canaveral aboard a SpaceX Dragon capsule, which you got to show him the jacket, Shane. He spent 199 days in orbit and returned home in November. Only three people in U.S. history have spent more days away from Earth than Shane, who's at 388 days. Before we formally welcome him, welcome him, let's take a look at this really cool video.
Church. So join me in welcoming home our very own Shane Kimbrough. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I had to put the jacket on since uh, the dean requested it. So here's our cool dragon patch on this jacket. But uh, it's great to be with you and all those online. Uh, it's going to be a fun uh, time here. Hopefully get to answer a bunch of your questions. Uh, that's a great video there. I'm, I'm not sure I need to say much more. You guys got any questions? But uh, um, I'll talk for a few minutes, and then I'll show you a little highlight video from our last mission that you can get a feel for what we did up there um, in 2021. And then we'll get rolling on some questions. But uh, it's, a, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to represent uh, Georgia Tech, obviously. Um, we have a lot of those folks in our world, um, whether they're astronauts or mission control folks um, or working in another NASA center all around. Uh, we have public affairs folks as well that are Georgia Tech grads. So um, Georgia Tech is everywhere, especially at the Johnson Space Center where we work. So it's pretty neat. Uh, every now and then we'll get a group picture with all of us. And uh, literally, it's about 100 to 150 folks at the Johnson Space Center that are Georgia Tech grads. So pretty cool, um, very cool. Um, all right, so just briefly, um, you heard a lot mentioned already, so I won't go into those details. But I know we have some, some uh, not, not always college and, and graduate students in the room, right? We're talking to some elementary schools and others. So I just want to make sure we'll do some space basics so everybody's kind of on the same level, all right, before we get going. because. Um, you, know, you folks will be much smarter than most of my audiences that I speak to, but um, most adults don't get these questions right. So I know you guys know. So when we go to space, when astronauts go to space these days, where, where do we go? ISS, which stands for what? International Space Station, okay? So that's our destination. Uh, it's not always gonna be our destination, but these days, over the last couple of decades, when astronauts go to space, they go to the International Space Station. So I know that seems very basic, but most, Adults don't know that, okay? Because every, every people, people I meet, they're like, hey, how is the moon? I'm like, <laughs> yeah, it looks pretty good, you know, but um, we haven't been to the moon since when? When was the last time we were with, a person was on the moon? Early 70s, early 1970s, right? So that's a long time ago, but most, most people equate space with moon for whatever reason. So that's when I meet people, they're like, hey, how is the moon? I don't know, so uh, you know, so it's it's just one of those. So all right, so you guys are way ahead of those. So we go to the space station. All right, um, currently we have um, a couple vehicles that can get us to the space station, as you're probably aware, and you saw some of those in the video. One of those is the Russian Soyuz vehicle can get us there, and then uh, most recently we have a U.S. vehicle, SpaceX um, Drag Crew Dragon, that gets us there. So um, I've been uh, honored to fly on both of those vehicles. Um, very both very capable. Um, and now with kind of comparing those to space shuttle, it's, you know, people are like, hey, what's the difference? Well, there's a lot of difference, all right? So I'll try to walk you through that real quick. Space shuttle, as you might remember, for those of you that have seen it, just sitting on the launch pad, right? The rockets are side by side to the vehicle, all right? Which creates um, a lot of power for one, but it creates some issues as well. Like you are really rocking and rolling, um, shaking around like you see in the movies on a launch, okay? So the launch is pretty dynamic until about two and a half minutes into the li after liftoff when the solid rocket boosters fall off, then it's just super smooth, pure acceleration, all right? Um, all three vehicles, by the way, take about eight and a half to nine minutes to get to space, so pretty quick ride either way, all right? The Soyuz, very tiny rocket, like first time I pull up to the launch pad, I'm like, wait, that's it? <laughs> um, because it is just tiny compared to the massive space shuttle. And it's the rocket, or the capsule sits on top of the rocket, so um, the dynamics are different, obviously. It's a much smoother ride all the way up. Um, I would say the Soyuz was the smoothest ride we had um, of the three that I've had. The Dragon is just a, kind of somewhere in between. So it's uh, the second stage on Dragon when that lights is pretty fantastic. So uh, um, the first stage lasts a couple minutes, and then you have a couple, about 10 seconds or so, of kind of weightless. So you're kind of like, all right, all right. And then when that second stage engine lights, it is very impressive. So uh, you're thrown back in your seat. It feels like your face is going to peel off, and you're just laughing the whole time. It's awesome. So um, really great rides up, all, you know, all very different, but very cool. And the acceleration is very similar because, um, again, you're getting to, to space in about you know, eight and a half, nine minutes. So going from zero on the launch pad to 17,500 miles an hour eight minutes later or so. Pretty cool acceleration, if you guys can think about that. So very fun, um, good ride. Landing landing was very different in all three vehicles as well. Um, space shuttle, as you know, probably lands, or does land on a runway. All right, it's a glider um, at that point. We don't have any engines, so you have one shot at landing that thing. 
So uh, that's why we put a ton of work into our commanders landing the space shuttle. And so that's a pretty nice, easy way to come home, honestly, landing on a runway. Um, the Soyuz, where does the Soyuz land? Does anybody know? I think I heard it, Kazakhstan, all right? You just crush into the ground, all right? So I mean, there's no like, you have a parachute that you're under, um, but, you're, but it's, it's a rough landing. <laughs> um, and ours, if you, if, you, if you want us to check out our landing, um, check out Expedition, 60, or Ex Expedition 50 landing on Google, it's pretty impressive. So we hit, we got a bonus ride. So we hit, we bounced, hit again, and then we tumbled three or four times before we came to rest. And uh, that's not what your body needs when you come back to Earth, <laughs> when you come back to gravity, I'll tell you that. So that was quite an interesting ride. Um, the SpaceX Crew Dragon um, come down under parachutes as well, and we, we splash down in the ocean or uh, the Atlantic Ocean or the Gulf of Mexico. So all three different. Uh, it's still a nice, firm hit uh, on SpaceX. So it's not like, oh, it's water. It's going to be soft. It's still a very firm hit, but you're not going to bounce, and, uh, and you're, you're pretty much there. The pro or the, one of the issues potentially with SpaceX is if the waves are high and stuff, you're just going to be bobbing around for a while, and that's not going to make you feel very good after coming back to Earth. So. Anyway, those are the three different experiences I've had. Um, uh, a lot of people want to know about that, so I kind of got that one out there early. Um, this past mission that we did, very honored to fly with some am amazing people. Uh, Megan MacArthur was our pilot. Um, we had Thomas Pesquet from France as one of our mission specialists, and Aki Hoshide was the other mission specialist from Japan. So super diverse crew, great people. Um, that's really what made the mission for us um, such a huge success was relying on these incredible people from different cultures. And that's not always the case. Sometimes you have, you know, mostly Americans or mostly Russians or whatever, but uh, this one was super diverse. Um, and our crew of four, we launched in April last year from the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, it's about a day to get to the space station. The, the way the um, trajectories work for SpaceX, at least currently, takes about a day. It took us 23 hours to get there. Uh, which wasn't the most fun day I've ever spent in my life. So uh, we can get into that more later. Uh, but then we get on board and we, we joined a pretty big group that was already there. There were seven people on board already. And so it got pretty crowded in a hurry um, before, because we joined crew one who was already there. We were crew two. We were going to overlap with them for a little bit. And there was a crew there as well. So um, it got pretty busy. The, the line to the bathroom was pretty long. Uh, you know, bottom line, that's, that's really what matters, right? So. Um, but it was really fun. We had a great time um, doing a lot of cool stuff up there, which you'll see in this video in a minute. Um, and then we ended up coming home a little later than expected, but uh, early November last year, uh, splashed down on November 8th, uh, which was my daughter's birthday, so that was kind of cool. And uh, not that that matters, but uh, it was cool for them. And uh, I got to come home, and uh, one of my daughters got married 10 days later, so it was, it was quite a whirlwind uh, coming back. Uh, it was getting pretty stressful there towards the end if I was going to make it back or not. But, uh, Apparently it worked out, so that was good. So I think we have a highlight video there. I hope you can just look around uh, this video and see kind of life on space station, what it's really like. Some of the science you'll see gets highlighted in here, which is really the main reason for the International Space Station. It's an incredible laboratory that we have. Um, so enjoy this, and I'll get back with you in just a minute. Today, a crew of two Americans, one European, and one Japanese astronaut will set off on a six-month science mission to the world's only orbiting laboratory. Three, two, one, zero. Mission and liftoff. Guys, one Endeavor alpha. and crew two. Copy one alpha. Endeavour launches once again. Four astronauts from three countries on Crew 2, now making their way to the one and only International Space Station. Hello, everyone. Welcome on board Endeavour. We're uh, a couple hours into the flight, making our second lap around the Earth. That's right, Crew Dragon Resilience actually coming into view a little bit <laughs> clearer now from the cameras aboard Dragon.
can see <laughs> Aki is the first to ingress onto the International Space Station. We're so excited to be here. We're ready to get to work. There's a lot of uh, great science, and uh, we're just excited to learn and get started. The experiment that's taking up most of my time right now is called Celestial Immunity, and it's a really interesting experiment that involves looking at immune pathways. And I have an expert that's looking over my shoulder via camera, and she can talk with me kind of step by step as we go through the process. That looks good, Megan. All right, thank you very much. I'm sure I'll be talking to you again tomorrow. <laughs> yes, you will. <laughs> Recently, I've been working on a really interesting educational experiment. It's called the blob. It's that, that uh, crazy monocellular being that has no brain but can learn uh, and can actually search food and solve mazes. It's, it's pretty contained on the space station. Don't worry about it. It's very tiny. Uh, but so we, we're, we're working on all kinds of endeavors like this and every day, you know, brings its, uh, its uh, lot of discoveries on the space station. That's very exciting. We're tracking a full and good deploy of that solar array. So well done, both of you. It's beautiful. We're in a season now, actually, of doing cargo ops. We have two spacecraft that are attached to us that brought us cargo, and now we're packing them back up to get them ready for departure. On board the International Space Station, we do help out some of the development of uh, medicine. Without gravity, you get uh, larger chunks of pure protein crystals. What we're looking for today are needle-like structures. Perfect, there they are. Well, it is a fantastic view that we have. We see the thin layer of atmosphere that's protecting all of you down on Earth. So just taking care of our planet has kind of been a change, maybe mentally, from seeing it from this perspective. We are growing some chili peppers in the plant habitat here in the Japanese experiment module. It's one of the more complicated things that have been grown in space, and so they do take a little longer to come to fruition. So we're really hoping that we get to try some peppers before the end of our mission. Over the years, the capabilities of the laboratory have expanded and grown, along with the interest in doing this kind of research in low Earth orbit, which I think is really remarkable. So we are really kind of at the peak of that, I think. And so we've seen a little bit of everything, right? We've done um, human immune system research, so lots of research into medication formation, um, fluids research, combustion research, even robotics research, this huge range of different things that we've gotten to touch during our mission. And the way science works, as you know, is this is the building blocks for stuff to come. And so the re results from these experiments will come out in the years to come, but they will also be the foundation of experiments that are designed in the following years. And so all of the research Research is going to be stuff that we get to say, oh, we had a little part of that. We got, we got our hands on a little bit of that, which is a pretty neat feeling. Endeavor, SpaceX's go for deorbit entry and landing. Captain, go for deorbit entry and landing. Good news. Hopefully you guys got a good flavor for what we were doing up there. And uh, we'll get to some questions if you have some of those later for sure. I think I have a couple pictures I like to show before I forget them. So can you all slap that one picture up there of Atlanta if you have it? And we'll talk about this real quick. Um, taking pictures of Earth became a hobby, I think, for everybody that goes up there. It's just such a cool perspective and uh, unique perspective that we have to take pictures of our planet. And uh, to me, it just made me really appreciate it. I mean, it's, it's kind of crazy. It takes you, or it took me at least, um, to get off the Earth to really appreciate the Earth, right? So here's a good picture of Atlanta. Um, you guys can maybe see a few features in there that you might recognize. Um, I see the football stadium there. 
You guys see that in the lower right? And then the rest of the campus kind of you can see around that. So that was cool. Um, this is a zoomed in view, really the, the marker there. If you kind of zoom out on the other picture, it's um, the thing you can really see is the Mercedes-Benz Stadium. You can actually see the logo from space, <laughs> which is pretty crazy. <laughs> And so uh, I sent, sent the picture over to those folks at the stadium. They're like, and one of the, the people is like, when we designed this, I said I wanted to be able to see it from space. And <laughs> it's proven. You, you proved it true. So uh, that was kind of cool to be able to do that. But uh, again, cool perspective for, from, uh, from us. And, and I got to see places, of course, around the world I've never been to or even heard of in, in some cases. And it just really made me appreciate the beauty um, of our planet all over the place. Whether, you know, you can think of beautiful places maybe that you've been or want to go to, like the Bahamas, right? Yeah, that's beautiful. But even places, deserts and, and other mountain ranges and parts of the world that you don't think of have their own striking beauty. And uh, to me, that was one thing I took away from uh, my missions uh, from the International Space Station. All right, thanks for that. Um, I think we'll get ready to roll into questions, Naya, if you're ready. Hopefully there'll be a few. Perfect. Well, can everybody hear me first of all? Awesome. Well, I just want to say thank you for everybody who decided to show up on a Friday afternoon. We're really excited to have you all here. Um, as you all may have heard earlier, thank you for the amazing introduction, Dean Bia. My name is Naya Butler-Craig, and I'm an aerospace engineering PhD student here, and I will serve as the moderator for today. Um, for uh, Shane's Q&A portion. And so as I just wanted to remind you that we are joined by you all here, which is a packed room. We're joined online via social media because um, we're streaming this event. And we're also joined by the future of aerospace, a couple of elementary schools, and most specifically Tuskegee Airmen Academy um, in Southwest Atlanta. So I'm really excited to jump into it. Um, housekeeping rules or housekeeping notes. If you have questions, feel free to raise your hand. Either Shane or I will call on you, and somebody will bring you a mic. So don't fret. We'll get to. We'll try and get to as many questions questions as we have um, as we can. Um, so I actually want to start off to kick us off right. and kind of set the vibe for our time today. Um, as an aspiring astronaut, and I know I'm not alone in this. Um, as a matter of fact, can our aspiring astronauts raise your hands? Actually, awesome. Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> So cool. we're looking at the future of who we want to be right here, right? So make sure you get your questions Old in. Old guy, <laughs> young people. That's OK. Future, this is good. This is the goal, right? <laughs> um, but one thing I've done you know, um, as an aspiring astronaut is read up on astronauts. And one common thread that I've seen is that perseverance is so crucial to the journey. Um, you have stories like Peggy Whitson, who applied 10 times before getting accepted, Leland Melvin, who almost got disqualified due to you know, medical reasons. And so I'm just curious to know what your perseverance story is. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's, it's a good one in my life as well for um, not just here, but other places as well. But uh, my NASA perseverance story was um, I applied four times. Um, and so I, I, I kind of feel like I finally wore them down enough um, that they'd invite me for an interview. But um, <laughs> And then to fly, like, I've been there for almost 20 years, right? And to only fly, I say only fly three times, but that's pretty awesome. Right? <laughs> but, uh, you know, you wait a while for your first flight, and then you may not get to ever fly again. But, uh, and it was a big gap between my first and second. And um, there are things like medical issues that come up with everybody almost, believe sure. it or not. We're, we're humans, right? right? We're not just robots. So I've had a lot of those issues as well and been able to, um, with the team, work through a lot of that to... Um, I didn't know if I'd ever fly again, but I wanted to really kind of maybe open the doors of the, the medical community, honestly, at NASA. And mm -hmm. so we went through several years of that. Um, and if it wasn't going to help me, that's okay. But I wanted it to help future astronauts and future people down the road. So guess what? It did. It is going to help them. And it also, eventually, I flew again. So it all worked out. Awesome. Uh, but it is, there is definitely a perseverance piece that you need, not just as an astronaut, but in life in general. Absolutely. I can definitely, I think everybody here, Georgia Tech students, can um, you know, relate to needing to persevere to get through <laughs> your goals, I'm sure. Um, and so I want to go ahead and take a question from online. We've got a question from James D. Martini. He is an eighth grader watching today at Dickerson Middle School in Marietta, and he asks, did being an NCAA pitcher and athlete help you at all when you were in space? Wow. <laughs> That's not one I get every day, Jack. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, you know, it, it, it always helps. Team sports, um, for those of you that have played that or been in groups, uh, to me it really helped me to understand how to be a, a teammate, right? How to be, 
Um, sometimes the leader, sometimes the follower. And, and, and at different times as an astronaut or in the military, I fell into both of those roles. And you got to know when you're the leader and when you're not. So I think team sports in general for me just helped me to understand that, hey, there's a lot of people that have opinions, and you're not the only one, right? Um, and that's really, it really helped me in life in general, just sports, competing, um, competing as a team, knowing that other people are counting on you and depending on you to do your job. And if you don't do it right, sometimes you know, you're know you not going to always do it right. But then maybe your teammate will pick you up. And if your teammate doesn't do something right, then maybe you can pick them up. So those are life lessons, honestly, not just for, for space, but they really helped me throughout my life um, being an athlete and being on team, a team, not just an individual sport. Definitely. And that's actually something I've heard before, too. Just um, Lou Melvin was a football player. Mm -hmm. Mae Jemison's a dancer. I like to dance. So that was something that actually <laughs> was super inspiring to me. So. Mm -hmm. I think that kind of leads me into this. Another question is like, what are the um, like the most unexpected skills that came in handy when you were an astronaut? Well, um, those are tough. I mean, we, we try to train a lot of that into folks because I mean, astronauts come from a variety of backgrounds, as, as you're alluding to. Um, some people come from the military. Some most astronauts these days about I think military is only about thirty percent of the astronauts, and then the other seventy is scientists, engineers, teachers, doctors. Um, so people with a wide range of backgrounds. And so when you bring that diverse group together, then you want to have some kind of level playing field. And so we, we get a lot of training on, on team care, on self-care. Um, self-care is a big thing, uh, especially when you're going on any big expedition like we get to go on every, every now and then. And that, that you really got to, and take care of yourself doesn't mean you're selfish. It means you're taking care of you so that other people don't have to take care of you. That's the way I look at it. Right, so, and I learned that in the military as well. So um, if, if people don't have to worry about me, then we as a group can, can be better as a group and function um, the way we're supposed to. If, if you're always, there's always somebody in your group, you guys have been on teams and been in groups, right? There's always somebody that's not really maybe pulling their weight or, or whatever, and you don't want to be that person, at least in our line of work. Um, so we try to train some of that out so everybody kind of can contribute. Um, everybody has incredible skills um, in, in the astronaut office and incredible, you know, diverse skills. Like, like, hey, I'm not so good at this, um, so I need you to help me here. And so humility is a big part of being it as well. But hey, I'm, I'm kind of strong in this area, so I maybe would lead this and you would lead that and you can teach me how to do this um, kind of deal. So nobody's perfect. Nobody knows everything, um, believe it or not. <laughs> we all are, are, we at least try to be very humble uh, and that just makes our teams better. I can definitely see that being super important, like having to spend such close, being in close quarters with that amount of people. And, right. you know, you have to be able to rely on each other and have that element of teamwork. Absolutely. Makes a lot of sense. So next, um, we'd like to say hello to Nancy Conrad, who was watching the live stream on YouTube. Nancy is the wife of late astronaut Pete Conrad, who was commander of Apollo 12 and the third man to walk mm. on the moon. So glad you're Jeez. watching, Nancy. Thank you for wow. joining us. <laughs> That's super impressive wow. and yeah, just exciting. And so I guess another question comes from YouTube and this is Mike a pleasure. And he asks, how has life in space shaped your life on Earth, parenting, career, or otherwise? Uh, like I mentioned earlier, it just gave me a different perspective. Um, seeing that thin layer of atmosphere that protects all of us down here from living and dying, honestly, um, super um, humble view of Earth and, and what it takes to survive. So I want to protect this place um, and I didn't, necessarily have that feeling before I left um, and went to space. Uh, so it really helped me appreciate what we have here, want to take care of what we have here. Um, maybe one day we'll be a multi-planet species, but currently we are not. Um, by the way, that's John Young's main goal way back when. And so uh, hopefully um, we'll, we'll do his legacy there one of these days. But uh, currently, this is all we have. And so definitely want to take care of it. Absolutely. I'm totally on board with that <laughs> train of thought. I know a lot of people think that the interest in space means you're abandoning Earth, but I don't think that's ever been any space geek's um, goal yeah. is to right. <laughs> abandon where, where we live. Um, and so I wanted to bring in, actually, the future of aerospace, our aerospace babies. I wanted to check in with London Rouse, who's watching at the Tuskegee Airmen Academy. Uh, Academy I'm sorry. Let's get a question from London. Oh, there, she is. there we go. <laughs> My question is: it's the ISS What technology. were you feeling when NASA tells you to be an astronaut? Okay, 
So London asked, what were you doing when NASA asked oh. you or told you that you were going to be an astronaut? Oh, wow. How did you find out? I've never heard that question, London. That's a great <laughs> one. So um, back in, let's see, this was 2003 is when I applied to be an astronaut the fourth time. <laughs> And I was asked to, to come down for an interview in around September of that year. Um, and if you get, get the chance to be, I tell people they want to be astronauts, say all you can ever hope is to get to the interview stage. At that point, it's pretty much out of your hands. And everybody at that level can get selected. I mean, it's just amazing. So there were several thousand people that applied, of course. And then uh, when you get down to that top 100 or so that get asked to be interviewed, you're in an incredible group of people. So went through that in September. Um, around, they were supposed to announce the new class in early 2004, so around January, February. Well, in December, they came out and said, hey, we're not going to announce the class. Congress decided not to have a class this year. And so we're like, dang it. <laughs> um, so it's just kind of this emotional roller coaster we were on for a while. And then around February, they said, oh, we're going to announce a class. And we're going to announce it in March. And March came, no class announcement. Um, but in early April of that year, uh, so what happens is, um, so out of that 100 that got interviewed, in my class, they picked 11 of us. Um, and so if you get a call, if you get the phone call from one person, it's good. If you get a phone call from another person, it's not the good call. <laughs> so at least you're getting a call. I mean, it's pretty honestly. So uh, I happen to be, I was working at NASA at the time. And so I was the first person to get called, not because I was the first person, but because they kind of knew me and they wanted to, actually the chief of the office gives you the, the call. And uh, he wanted to kind of run things through me to make sure he was squared away for the next people. Because he was kind of nervous, <laughs> which is kind of, kind of funny. I'm like, wait, what? So uh, anyway, he called me, he told me a bunch of stuff that, you know, asked, you know, said, hey, we want you to come be an astronaut, which is amazing. And then, like, all the details after that were completely incorrect and, you know, and all this. And so, he, so it was kind of funny how that went down. And, and most of the astronauts that aren't pilots, they'll send them to um, Pensacola for Navy flight training just to get them some basic flight skills. And so he's like, yeah, you're going to go to Navy Pensacola. And I'm like, awesome. I was already a pilot. But I was like, this will be great. <laughs> you know, and they're like, oh, wait. No, no. And I could hear someone in the background like, no, no, he's not going. You know? <laughs> so I was like, dang it. So that was just kind of funny the way it played out. But uh, obviously, I was just sitting at my desk when I got the call um, at work one day. And i um, super thrilled and uh, happy to be here. Thanks for the question, London. Thank you, London. That's a great question. I, I honestly dream of that day, too. Like, what am I doing? Who am I going to tell first? So who did you yeah. tell first? <laughs> uh, I called my wife, of course. Uh, we were getting ready to move because the Army was calling me back to, to work. A uh, real job, I guess. <laughs> and, uh, um, we got to call my wife first, tell her to take the sign out of the yard. <laughs> we're going to be here a little while. And uh, so that worked out great. Awesome, awesome. So I definitely want to open it up to the room. Were there any questions brewing? Oh, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I did not know we had that many questions. Um, let's start way in the back uh, there. Uh, yes, you. <laughs> with, with the white jacket on, I think. That's, yep. We can get her a mic. Raise your hand again. There we go. So what would you say was the most uh, difficult part of the astronaut application process? The most difficult part of the application process, I mean, this, it, things have changed, right? I mean, 20-something years ago, we didn't have a lot of the things you have now, right? Mm -hmm. So now it's all in line. It's virtual kind of deal. So back then, you had to handwrite a lot of your essays and things. And so, you know, and so that was, you guys don't even know what that is, do you? But uh, um, so to me, that was kind of the most difficult part was just getting through all of the kind of the background things and, and you kind of had to hand write in all your references and that kind of stuff. So things have changed a bunch. I think that's much more smooth now. Uh, and then it was just, you know, kind of the waiting game. You had, to, again, the perseverance thing of, of are you going to get the call to be in the top 100 and when is that going to be? And. Um, that kind of deal. So again, I applied three times before, never got that call, but uh, that fourth time, lucky enough to do it. That's amazing. Yeah. Any more questions from the room? Let's get a couple more. Uh, can I do pink shirt? Oh, we can get you a mic. <laughs> I'm sure you can project. I don't doubt you. <laughs> so what was the biggest challenge you faced when you were on the ISS? Yeah, this time we had several challenges, unfortunately. <laughs> but uh, usually you like to go there, and hopefully there are no major challenges. And that was kind of the case on my last flight. Um, but this one was different. So we had several 
pretty um, interesting moments, I'll say. So um, this time the Russians were launching a new module, which hasn't, you know, they haven't launched a new module since um, almost 20 years. Now, but they have this new module they wanted to send up there, and it's been in the works for over a decade, but just delays and things have kept them from launching. Well, it actually ended up coming up during our flight, and it had a lot of issues um, shortly after launch with uh, communications with the rocket and commanding to it and, and things, and the vehicle was not, not performing well, honestly. So um, just to actually get it on board was a huge feat um, between the, all the, not, the mission control centers around the world that are, you know, kind of uh, have, have skin in the game when things come to the space station well. Because uh, there were some issues with the helium and the oxygen, uh, excuse me, the, the, um, the oxygen kind of potentially a, a huge fire hazard and blowing up and stuff. And so, yeah, we were like, yeah, we don't want that thing coming up here. And, <laughs> um, and eventually the leaders down here figured out that's yeah, safe enough, we're gonna bring it on board. So um, it docked, I think this was maybe September, October the, this past year when it got there. Um, so it's on the bottom, it docks to the bottom of the space station. So it's gonna be this huge module that they have. It's really incredible. I mean, science module, it's really great. Um, but unfortunately, shortly after docking, um, the computer system kind of went nuts and it started firing its engines like it was leaving, like it was departing the space station. So if you think about this, so it's docked to the bottom of the space station with, with hooks, like you know metal hooks that are holding on and it's firing, it's just trying to pull that away. All right, and then the whole space station, which is massive like you saw in the video. So what, what was the result of that is that we started tumbling out of control. Um, the space station was literally tumbling out of control. Um, the, the alarms all started going off. <laughs> we all kind of, you know, did what we were supposed to do, meet in like the central location and start working procedures. Miss Control's like, get into this procedure now, you do these steps. And, and usually in situations like this, Mission Control just sends all the commands and it all works out. Well, they couldn't send commands to the vehicle because it was tumbling so fast and it couldn't communicate. So we were actually sending commands to the vehicle, which we, we've been trained on, but we never would expect to do to send commands to the vehicle. So all that good training came into play and um, it's called a LOAC, so loss of attitude control is what happened. That was the malfunction. Um, and so, I don't know, it took maybe half an hour to an hour or so to get everything under control and um, back in the correct attitude. And then we, we got a bonus because we got to do it again about a month later um, <laughs> when the, the Soyuz that, it, that had our crewmates up there, the Russian crewmates, um, when it was getting ready to depart, um, maybe a week before departure, they do a, a thruster test, so a, a engine firing test. And guess what? Pretty much the same thing happened <laughs> because uh, some commands were sent wrong from the ground and that kind of stuff. So again, we're tumbling out of control. <laughs> <laughs> and so nobody's ever had this happen. We had it happen twice in, in a month. So uh, not something you really want to have happen. But those are the biggest kind of emergency things that we had to deal with on this flight. Wow. And, and I'm sure that like astronauts know they assume a certain amount of risk. And I can't imagine how brave you have to be to want and go and pursue that risk even after experiencing something like that. So that kind of leads me to Trayvon. Um, Trayvon's question, he's a fourth grader from Hollis Academy. Hi, Trayvon, if you're watching, and well, hopefully you are. Um, <laughs> and he wants to know if you always knew you wanted to be an astronaut. Uh, I, I always, yeah, I would say since I was a small child, because um, I, I don't know, many of you in the room are not as old as I am, but when I was a small child, that's when men were landing on the moon. Um, and that just captivated the entire country, honestly. I mean, that, that was such a huge feat um, still today, but, even, but back then with the limited technology, it was just incredible. So. Uh, I, you know, I, I didn't know if you know, I was a little kid watching the TV and like, wow, that's cool. But um, everybody kind of my age wanted to be an astronaut, right? It was just right. the cool thing to do at the time and um, with nobody ever thinking they could do it. But, um, and I also had the good fortune, my grandparents lived across from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. So I spent a lot of time down there as a kid. Uh, when my father was, was deployed to Vietnam, we kind of lived down there with my grandparents some. Mm. And so my grandfather would drag me out to see anything launching. I mean, it didn't matter if it had people on it or not. So I kind of had it in my blood, honestly, from my grandfather and the inspiration that he gave me to want to be an astronaut. Um, ironically, when I went to West Point for college, I, I thought that dream was gone. And I kind of gave up on it because I didn't know you could be in the Army and be an astronaut. But it turns oh. out you can. <laughs> so, Very interesting. So um, and once I found that out, is when I, early in my Army career, um, I kind of relit that fire. and. Um, then started pursuing things like getting a graduate degree at Georgia Tech, which certainly helped um, in my, my eventually getting to be, get, get interviewed and be an astronaut. So. Wonderful. And that actually leads me to another question. 
um, from Brooklyn Canty, who's watching on YouTube, and she asked why you chose to study industrial engineering. Oh, here. Um, so at the point in my military career, um, there's kind of a few years after you've done your command time in the Army, at least, where you have um, a few years to, I don't say mess around, but do something different if you want. Um, you can stay mainstream, but you can do something different. I decided I got the opportunity to go to graduate school that was offered to me by the Army, which was amazing. Um, and I was kind of late in the process, and so they're like, hey, all we have left is Georgia Tech. I'm like, what? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Get to go back home to Atlanta, Georgia Tech? <laughs> So, and, and so in the slot was for ISYE, um, systems engineering. And so that's, um, that's the reason I got it. Um, wasn't like I was against aerospace or anything, but that's the reason I got it. And then, then the kind of the payback to the army was I went to, I got the good fortune to go teach at West Point after that. Um, and kind of use some of those skills to pay back the army um, for the education that they gave me. So. That's how it works, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So I saw a couple hands up um, for questions in the room. I think blue shirt. Yeah. Yes, sorry um, to call you blue shirt. I wish I knew your name. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I'm also a student in IFYE. Um, and so I was wondering, so you, you mentioned why you chose uh, IFYE, but do you feel like it was relevant to your career as an astronaut? Because yeah. it's mainly statistics, right? Yep, statistics, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, optimization of things, right? So I mean, that helps, and it helped me as, as an Army officer as well as an astronaut for sure. Um, and just, I mean, the way we problem solve, right, and think about things. I mean, when I see a line anywhere, I'm like, why is that happening? Like, anybody else in the room like that? Like, why? There's no reason there should be traffic there. There's no reason there should be a queue here. I mean, that's just the way my, my mind works. And uh, I think it's from my background here at Georgia Tech and Systems Engineering, because I just want to solve it. I just want to, like, no, that can't happen. Don't put your brakes on, because it's going to cause all this, right? And, so um, that's kind of just the way. But the problem-solving skills, I think, in any engineering discipline in general, just set you, set you up for success as an engineer, as a, just anybody in life, as, you know, no matter what company you're working for, everybody has problems, right? And so we, we need good problem-solvers, people that think clearly. And I think a lot of that came from my background in the engineering um, here and at West Point. Very good. Let's take another question from the room. I'll let wow. you choose, actually. <laughs> How about red in the back? Yeah. Oh, do you mind if we get you a microphone really fast? Thank you. Just so our streamers can hear. You said the word safe enough, um, implying that sometimes it's not 100% safe. Is there some sort of like reconciliation you go through? Like, oh, I trust the engineers who built this rocket before you get on? Or are you just going to go? <laughs> Oh, yeah. Really, really. Uh, very, very good question. I mean, there's so many things that, that could potentially go wrong on a rocket launch, right? And so, yeah, I mean, at a certain level, you personally at some point have to just get comfortable with everybody's doing their job correctly. Like, I'm not going to get to meet all the engineers that designed this thing, that built this thing, that are working on it today even, especially with COVID, with the SpaceX launch. We didn't get to interact with their employees at all, unfortunately. Um, so we didn't really have that bond that we, we would have normally. Um, with either our mission controllers, our flight controllers, the people that work on the vehicle, um, the Falcon 9 folks. Um, and so we absolutely trusted what they were doing. Uh, now, it doesn't go with like, hey, show us the data. And they would show us the data. It was all virtual, of course, this time. But um, we had lots of questions. There were issues going on with previous launches um, that they were doing. And they had to really explain away to us. Their en engineers did why this wouldn't be a problem for us, honestly. And um, we had a few things kind of late in the game. Uh, SpaceX is, if, if you didn't know, they're launching about once a week on average, which is absolutely incredible. Um, and so they they have a lot of data points now. And um, even though there weren't people on most of those, it was the same rocket. So the issues could, could be similar. And so they're, even their high-level management folks would, would at times come in to brief us on the issues. And then the engineers would follow up with, hey, here's... Here's, here's what we've done to fix it, and here's why it's not going to happen to you. So, yeah, you definitely got to get used to it. And, and the, the safe enough part, or safe comment I talked about earlier was when we were in space, right? So that was a whole other level that we as a crew had to get comfortable with. Like, our team's on the ground. We're getting enough data from the Russians in that case that they were comfortable with bringing this thing on board. If, the, if that vehicle was an American vehicle, I don't think we would have brought it on board. I think we would have just tossed it back in the ocean, honestly. Um, so it was at that level. It was really dicey at for a bit on whether the thing was going to come aboard or not. But 
our, our incredible flight directors were leading the team down there in Mission Control Houston and coordinating with the Russians and other control centers to make sure we were, they were comfortable enough. And then once they said they were, then we were on board. Um, at some point, you gotta, whether I agree with it or not, you gotta trust them and, and you gotta go with it. That makes a lot of sense. I could imagine the, the, importance, of, the importance of teamwork in those situations, <laughs> having to trust so many different entities and um, right. moving kind of parts. But we're talking about safety on the ground, and we got a pretty cool question about safety in space and what type of threats or possible friendlies you might meet. And so we've got Fulton <laughs> Science Academy, who is watching on Facebook, and they want to know what you think about extraterrestrial intelligence. Oh. ET. E.T. <laughs> yeah. So I haven't seen aliens, if that's what you're really asking about. So I don't believe in them. I haven't seen them. Um, yeah. I mean, if you looked outside and saw something, that would be pretty crazy. But uh, even if it was an object that, that potentially could hit you, um, if you look outside the window and you see something, that's a bad day because something's gotten really close. That Because um, things in that environment are moving super fast. And if they, of course, if they hit you, it's going to be a bad day on the space station. So... Um, yeah, sorry. Everybody wants to say, like, yeah, I saw one, or <laughs> I did this, but yeah. That's what they think until yeah. it's a truth, and it's <laughs> like, right. wait, what? <laughs> yeah. Just in the movie so far. So, right. Yeah. Awesome. So let's take one more question, or a couple more questions yeah. from the room. I'll let you choose. Um, yes, gentleman here. Yeah, so I was wondering, um, could you just kind of walk us through what it's like, like on launch day, especially like for SpaceX and the Crew Dragon? Yeah. Um, I think you get up, you get up about five, hour, five hours before launch is the wake up time. Um, and of course, we're usually up before that, but because um, you're ready to go at that point. But the schedule says about five hours before launch is wake up. Um, you'll have about half an hour to kind of you know, take a shower, just get dressed and get ready. And then you'll go down for, um, and we'll call it the last supper, but uh, a, a meal. Um, <laughs> breakfast usually because we, we've, sleep shift, we've sleep shifted. So, even though we were getting up about midnight, I think, for our launch. Uh, we were, you know, so around 1 o'clock in the morning, we're eating breakfast, um, our last kind of meal before we launch. And that's, uh, that's kind of a public event as well. So there'll be some cameras in there initially um, for that to be shown later on. And then they, the cameras leave, and then you can actually eat and, <laughs> and just relax. And then, um, and so then, you, then it's kind of game on from that point. So you go down, you have about an hour of, of time to just either maybe pack your suitcase up or whatever you have laying around and uh, maybe take a shower if you hadn't done that before or just uh, sit there and think about what's going to happen <laughs> in the next few hours. Um, we have about an hour there. And then we uh, kind of get in our undergarments, which are like long underwear um, for SpaceX. And uh, we'll then, the next big event is the weather briefing, which is um, about four I guess about three and a half hours to four hours before launch, we'll come in a big conference room um, with SpaceX. And she asked about that. They give you these, these cool robes to wear um, over your undergarments. So you come in there looking all cool. And everything's all black, of course. And, um, and so you have the weather brief. And you've had a weather brief the day before. So this is just kind of any updates. Um, like it's either like really short, like everything's the same, it's all good. Or hey, we're looking at this, you know, the winds or whatever. They're, um, ours was, had a few things that were worried about the winds, and, but uh, we kind of got the brief. And then we update our tablets. So we have tablets that we fly on the vehicle. And so you kind of put the new weather data in there and get those updated. And from, from there, you go right to Some people kind of go hit the restroom again real quick. Uh, but then you're going in the suit room, which you, from there, you may have seen that, uh, where we go in and we, we get our suits on. You get in a little um, mock-up chair, um, like it's, it's in the vehicle. And you get pressurized to make sure there's no leaks in your suit. Um, all that takes, you know, half an hour to 45 minutes or so. Um, then we'll have some VIPs typically come in to talk to us, um, whoever happens to be there. For us, it was uh, NASA Administrator and Elon Musk would come in just for a few minutes. They have like two or three minutes max to just say hello, talk. Um, um, it could be the, the vice president or the president, whoever happens to be down there. But those kind of level people would come in. And then, uh, and then we, you probably seen it, we do the walkout. Um, we get to see our families there real quick. Um, this was in the middle of the night, so it's really hard on them, but it was 2 or 3 in the morning by that point, by the time we got outside. And uh, this with COVID, you know, had a safe distance away, but you get to, like, I sit in front of my wife and, and kids and just got to say a few last words, wave at them. Um, and then we get in our Teslas, of course, because it's SpaceX. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, Model X with the wing doors. So, oh, yeah, it's pretty sick. Yeah, and, uh, and they change the license plate every time with some cool space you know, saying on it or whatever. And, um, 
So we hop in those, head out to the launch pad, and then in the in the vehicle, honestly. So we have a like they're like, what's your playlist? And so like for it was Megan, MacArthur, and I in our Tesla, and the other two were behind us in, the, in another Tesla. But um, and then we just they kind of crank whatever music you ask them to play on their playlist kind of deal. So some people don't want to hear; they just want to be silent and just um, because they're you know a little anxious or nervous. Uh, we were jamming out pretty good in ours. <laughs> and, uh, and little did I know, Megan was into hard, heavy metal. But uh, I was like, wow, we need to tone this down a little bit, Megan. But uh, that got her ready to fly in space, I guess. And uh, so from there, we get to the pad. We, we um, head up the elevator to take us up to about the 200-foot level. It's where the, the walkway is. We head out into the vehicle. Megan and I got strapped in first, um, being in the, the center two seats. And then Tamanaki came in and got strapped in. Even after that, we're, we're on the pad for a couple hours before we launch, and so um, we're doing some stuff, but generally that's just time that you, you're just trying to kill. So we played some game of silly games, and Tamai introduced us to like, some European thumb game that you play. And <laughs> so if you see, saw the video, we're like doing all this stuff, and everybody's like, what are y'all doing? <laughs> like, oh, we're just playing a game, killing time. But uh, when it's ready to go, you know, I mean, when, when launch time comes, you're ready to go, because it's not the, I mean, it's kind of comfortable on those chairs, but. Still, you've been sitting in the same position for a couple hours, and you're ready for those engines to light. And uh, hopefully, that answered your question. Yeah. All right, cool. Awesome. Thank you for the question. Um, we're going to just revert back to our Tuskegee friends. Uh, we've got Jordan Williams, who is standing by at Tuskegee Airmen Academy, and we want to get her question. Hi, Jordan. What skills do you need to have? Can you say it again? Sorry. Go ahead, Jordan. Try one more time. Sorry about that. Uh oh, Jordan. I know can't. she's talking. <laughs> it sounds like the mic is off over there, but um, she is asking, what are the skills and characteristics a person needs to have in order to be successful as an astronaut? Oh, very good question. Um, there's a lot, um, of course. When we're going through the selection process now, and we just hired a new class, and so what kind of people we're looking for, kind of, as I think about that, I will hopefully answer your question. But um, you know, everybody, like I mentioned before, has very diverse backgrounds. But you want people that are great team players, as we've talked about already, um, that can be a part of a team. And, and honestly, like if I'm sitting across from somebody and I'm trying to see if they're going to be an astronaut or not, and I'm like, is that person going to annoy me? Like, <laughs> I mean, it comes down to that. I'm going to be in this small space for up to six, seven months. Are they going to be super annoying? And I don't want that person, right? And so it's little things like that in your personality. It's hard to quantify that, but it's, uh, they're just some people that, uh, as you might know, a few of those um, that you wouldn't <laughs> want to spend a, a lot of time with. Um, and so you know, people that uh, take care of themselves, people that are humble, people that will admit that they don't know everything, those are skills that are actually good um, to have. Uh, an example I'll give of that in space is um, our crew was super great and very transparent. Um, and one of the things I liked is like, uh, say we wake up in the morning, everybody's kind of getting breakfast, and if you didn't sleep well, we would admit it to our other crewmates, be like, hey, I didn't sleep well, I need you to watch me today um, so I don't make a mistake, um, things like that. And so both my last two crews have been like that, and it just, it just takes, everybody, it takes the edge off. And those are kind of the people you want. You don't want somebody powering through that didn't get any sleep or they're dealing with an issue at home um, that's really stressing them out and then it's shown in their performance that they're going to make a bunch of mistakes. And we don't want to do that, especially with the research we're doing. We, want to, we do not want to mess up all those researchers' work. Um, and so if we have one of those kind of days, you just want the people that are honest and will admit that, hey, I need some help today. And so I think that's a great trait, not just for astronauts, but uh, in life in general. Great question, great question. And that's something I've even learned in my little bit of research that the technical skills are important, but you know, they're, they're um, not more important than the interpersonal and kind of Absolutely. the personal skills. Yeah. That's great. So let's, um, we have a couple more minutes left. So I wanted to get some more questions from the room. Let's do, can I get black shirt? Um, first of all, thank you for coming. Yeah. We can get you a mic just so we can. <laughs> some good projectors in this room, huh? Thank you. I said, first of all, thank you for coming to talk to us. We really appreciate yeah. it. Um, looking to the future uh, of human spaceflight, and especially with activities like the Inspiration4 mission and the Axiom1 mission coming up, and then if you think in the 10-year time frame, in the 2030s, 
what do you think would be the new pathways for perhaps some of us here and those who are listening online who aspire to be an astronaut in the 2030s and 2040s, what do you think would be the new pathways for people to um, get into space, whether working in space as a NASA astronaut or just doing research in maybe private commercial stations um, that you've kind of seen or know? Yeah, you got a lot of money, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, that seems to be the pathway right now for folks, right, that aren't astronauts. But uh, that's going to change, right? It's going to become more routine over the next uh, decade or so, which I, I hope is the case, right, which will open up the opportunity to, to many more people to go experience what I got to experience for so long. It's just incredible. So, um, yeah, it's a great question what it's going to look like. I mean, the private industry is really the, the big deal right now, and it's awesome. I mean, it's creating so much interest in space. Um, a lot of people are like, oh, you at NASA don't like it, right? I'm like, I love it. It's awesome, right? I mean, all these... You know, different companies are being very creative and all have different solutions and different looking vehicles. And um, so it's really an exciting time to be in the space business. So you guys uh, that are interested, this is the awesome time to, to be going into that world. Um, and then I hope, you know, I hope, you know, with, with, the, with the Starship that, that SpaceX has, I mean, they're, they're going to have like, you know, 20 to 50 seats or something on that thing. So, I mean, eventually, <laughs> like you could fly like 50 people at a time. That's pretty awesome. And, uh, and so that's kind of where we're heading. And I don't know what that, you know, that mission profile is going to look like, but you know, that's what they're thinking down the road. And that, that's amazing. I don't know what Blue Origin, what their kind of end game is, but they're, you know, they're launching people these days as well. Um, and there'll be many more companies, uh, hopefully after that, that'll, that'll do the same thing. And so, again, it's exciting time to be in the space business. We at NASA are kind of, uh, I think we're at the tail end of low Earth orbit stuff. And then we're, obviously our next goal is to get to the moon again and have a sustainable presence on the moon in the next decade or so, which is going to be pretty awesome, and which will just help us as we eventually get to Mars um, here in the next few decades. But that's, uh, at least for NASA, that's a couple decades away. Maybe Elon will get there quicker with a person. But uh, it's very, very challenging. And if you haven't thought about the, you know, how far things are away, let me just run that by you real quick. So uh, how high is the space station? Does anybody know? 400 kilometers, about 250 miles or so on average. Okay, how far is the moon? About a quarter million miles, or excuse me, 250,000 miles away, all right? So, I mean, that's, how did we get there in the 60s? Wow, <laughs> I don't know, but we did. All right, so that's a whole nother magnitude, right? And then Mars is about, you know, the closest, it's around the 30 million mile range. So that's just crazy. So different environment, different radiation environment to get you know, people through. All of those challenges we, we haven't figured out yet, but NASA is committed to doing that, um, which is great. And that'll, we'll, we can't do it without international partners. We can't do it without private industry. And so all of us hopefully can uh, eventually put a human there. And not just put a human there, but bring them back safely to Earth, which is the main part. So. Definitely. And yeah, I mean, I, we, I'm sure we've all seen it. Um, just the commercialization has upticked. Uh, quite a lot, and we've got a lot of different partners really playing really hard to get to space, and I think that opens up so many opportunities for all of us who are, you know, have goals of contributing to space in the long term. Um, so I want to take another question from inside the room. Uh, let's go toward the back. A blue mask, please. Let's get them a mask. Can you guys, there's a picture up there. You guys can see the Mercedes-Benz logo maybe down at the bottom there. Wow. <laughs> That's pretty crazy. Uh, hi. Uh, how different was uh, Crew Dragon, like the control system of Crew Dragon, than you know Soyuz capsule and other stuff? Like, uh, was it more ergonomic? Was it more easier to work with the control system? Uh, yeah, the the Crew Dragon. Thanks for the question. The Crew Dragon was incredible, right? I mean, it is it is a futuristic spacecraft. Everything's touchscreen. It's sleek looking, right? Um, I mean, look at the vehicles I flew on before that space shuttle, which was designed when anybody know? 70s, right? 60s and 70s technology. Soyuz, even before that. <laughs> so, so, I mean, I've flown on these vehicles that are, I mean, honestly, archaic um, due to current technology, where you get in Crew Dragon and it is, it is current technology. It's unbelievable. I mean, you don't have a joystick in your hand, you don't have any control feel like you know, most pilots want to have. But it's pretty cool if you can fly the vehicle by touching things, <laughs> right? I mean, and the screens are just incredible. You the situational awareness we had with the models that SpaceX has created on their displays is, is phenomenal. So yeah, it was a real treat to fly their vehicle and fly something that was of this decade, <laughs> for sure. Awesome. 
Well, with that said, these are all the questions that we can take at this time, but I believe we have 15 minutes or so after if you want to come and um, come up and ask Jane a couple questions after the session. Um, I think that we can take those outside, or can they come up? And five yeah. more minutes in here, we're going to break down, and then... Okay. There okay. we go. So five more minutes in here, and then we can follow it outside. So sorry if we couldn't get to your question, but thank you all for being here. Thank you to those watching online. Thank you, yeah. Shane. Thank you. For your thank time. you all. <laughs> My pleasure, thank you. Let me turn this off. Recording has stopped.